So we talked a little bit last week about uh, anchors, how Christ is our anchor behind the veil in heaven. And I want us to start by, by considering anchors because that theme sort of continues through what we're going to see today. But anchors are one of the most important pieces of equipment on a ship. And unless you've been around ships and sailed in ships, you might not know exactly how they work. I know growing up, I always just kind of assumed that since it's heavy, it holds the ship steady in the water when they don't want to move around. But there's actually a little bit more to that. And of course, there's different kinds of anchors, but generally the idea is you drop the anchor until it reaches the, the floor of the body of water where you are, where there's reefs or rocks or other things down there. So you drop it to that depth, and then as you move the ship away from that area, the anchor digs in. It'll catch on rocks or a reef or whatever it finds deep down into the water. It, it attaches to whatever is on the floor. And so often you want to drop the anchor when, some, when like for instance, a storm blows in and the wind would, would threaten to blow you off course. That would be when you drop the anchor. And it would stabilize your ship. It would, it would keep you where you need to be. It would provide a, a solid uh, anchoring. You know, that, that word is, is in our vocabulary. It would anchor you. And it would provide that sense of, of, of safety and would provide safety uh, in not blowing you off course and, and allowing you to be lost at sea somewhere, not being carried away by the, the, the winds that are blowing. It's what makes a ship solid in a dangerous situation like that. So as the world sets itself against Christ, as we've heard over the last several passages, and against us, his people, for his name's sake, as the enemy sets his snares for our soul, and, uh, and even, even as the corruption that remains in us, fights against our faith. What stability do we have? Where is our anchor? Where do we look? Let's turn to John chapter 16. We're going to pick back up uh, on this conversation between Jesus and his disciples as they're walking this path out of Jerusalem to the garden uh, where Jesus would be arrested, betrayed and arrested. And they, they are almost there. Uh, in fact, this passage we're going to look at today is the last bit of dialogue, back and forth dialogue, between Jesus and his disciples in this discourse. Uh, the remaining chapter is will be Jesus, of course, praying his high priestly prayer, praying on behalf of his disciples and us. So this is really the last like instruction Jesus gives in, the, in this narrative. Uh, before his betrayal. And Jesus, just to, to since that's where we are, we're going to recap a little bit. Jesus has taught them many wonderful things. He, he pictured the self-sacrificing nature of the redemption that he would bring as he humbled himself and washed their feet, even in the midst of their, uh, their prideful arguing back and forth of who was the greatest. Jesus humbled himself. And taught them by that, that through his work, through his humbling of himself, they're clean. And not only that, that, that he would go on cleansing them through faith. He would go on washing their feet. He gave them, through, throughout this discourse, he gave them glimpses into the, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. He taught them that he had come forth from the Father and that he was going to be betrayed and that he would go to where go away from them to where they would no longer see him but that they would see him again both in his resurrection and when the spirit comes and gives them understanding the spirit his own presence in the spirit uh, and that he would one day return and take them back to the glory above that destiny that he won for them by laying his life down and living 
a righteous, living righteousness in their place. He told them that they would be hated and rejected by the world. And, and told them of all of this opposition they would face in his name. And how they are to love one another out of the love that he's given them. And depend on God together in prayer. He taught them how as they rely on Christ and, and his sufficiency for them, that he would bear fruit in them. That his very nature and his, his mind and his, uh, his image would be formed in them. And that they would literally carry out the works of Christ as he dwells in them. How they would bear fruit. How he would fill them with love and joy and gratitude. Which would be the fuel that would propel them into all the work he's called them to do. And then last week, we saw as he began to prepare them for the grief they were going to face. As their Savior was snatched away from them. And murdered. And placed in a tomb. But he told them of this untouchable, unshakable foundation of joy that they would have in His resurrection and His ascension to the Father. And through virtually all of this teaching, all of this preparation Jesus is giving them, we've seen the disciples scratch their heads in confusion and frustration even. Not understanding what all of this is that He's saying to them. All of these massive changes that were coming. And that's where we find the disciples today. Jesus is giving this last bit of instruction to his bewildered disciples. Before he, he praises, prays for them and then crosses over the ravine of the Kidron to the place of his betrayal. They're confused. And so he comforts them with the assurance that very soon they were going to understand. They were going to understand everything clearly. And we will see Jesus this morning set the anchor of His victory. His victory in their place. He will set that anchor, that anchor which will hold them in everything that comes to pass. So John chapter 16, let's start reading in verse 25. We'll read the first part of it here. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you've loved me. And have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So looking at the first part of verse 25 there, he says, These things I've spoken to you in figurative language, and hours coming when I'll no longer speak to you in figurative language. We saw last week one of the, the really clear examples of Jesus speaking to them a figurative language. Remember, he spoke of his death and resurrection as them no longer seeing him and then them seeing him. So instead of coming out and plainly uh, uh, stating it, he spoke figuratively. And then he, he pointed to their emotions. Remember that he, he told them of the grief they were getting ready to feel, but how that grief would be turned into joy. So these are, are figurative ways. He's not directly telling them. So one, one thing to note here, Jesus has been figurative at times. He has uh, uh, been indirect, if you will, but he's never been misleading. In nothing that he's said has he deceived them or misled them or, or even necessarily uh, uh, stepped around the truth. He's told them the absolute truth. Any confusion that they've had has been because of their own lack of understanding. It's been their own uh, ignorance that has led to this head-scratching frustration. It hasn't been that Jesus hasn't been clear, because he has. But Jesus is 
is referring, when he says, I'll, I will, I'll speak plainly to you of the Father, he's referring to the coming of the Spirit. Which, as we also looked at last week, that would, he would speak plainly to them. Because the Spirit would give understanding. They would then have the understanding they would need to understand the words of Christ. When he illuminated them, all of these words that Christ spoke to them would be plain. They would understand it all. So when he says uh, in the last part of verse 25, but I will tell you plainly of the Father, he's speaking to the illuminating the Spirit would give them. He isn't, uh, when he says of the Father, he's not saying that it's that one subject, right? But he's not just saying the first person of the Trinity is, is, is everything, is the whole body of knowledge that he would give. But he's pointing to the Father in glory above as the ultimate goal of redemption. That, that's, the, that's the end goal. That's the destination. And so when the Father above and our relation to him in Christ is understood, everything becomes plain. So Jesus points to the ultimate as to sum up all that, that the Spirit would illuminate for them. So Jesus goes on to make this very plain to them in verses 26 to 27. This is, these are some amazing words here. Starting in verse 26, he says, In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from the Father. If you remember last week, uh, verse 24 of, of last week's passage, Jesus taught them about praying in his name. And you remember, uh, that idea is tied to his mediation. Jesus going to be the one to mediate between us and the Heavenly Father. And how, just as the priests in the Old Covenant offered sacrifices on behalf of the worshipers and prayed for the people so Jesus would be the same in the same way offer his own sacrifice and pray for us continually so here in uh, in in verse 26 Jesus returns to that idea this idea of, of mediating between us and the father but he brings a whole new clarity to it here an incredible clarity is here in these words Jesus says that as they pray in his name, he's not saying that he's then going to have to beg the Father on our behalf. That is not what his mediation is. When Jesus returns to the glory above as, as our mediator, it's not some impersonal thing. It's not Jesus trying to persuade uh a reluctant father to listen to us and accept us and, and give us what we need. First of all, Jesus' wounds are themselves a perfect prayer. They pray louder than, than any words we could ever utter. They plead our case day and night before the Father. His blood is continually there before the Father, and it mediates in and of itself. It always, continually, day and night, makes us entirely acceptable to the Father. And secondly, as Jesus said, He doesn't need to, to persuade the Father on our behalf because the Father Himself loves us in Christ. We are entirely acceptable and beloved at all times in Jesus. In fact, we are just as accepted and beloved as Christ himself is in the courtroom of God. The gospel teaches us that, that when we receive the free gift of salvation that Christ offers, we were united with him through faith. That means that we have been declared to be righteous. 
Christ's own righteousness is counted as ours before the Father. His death and His burial fully satisfied justice on our behalf. That's the constant reality of our standing before the Father. Righteous in Christ's own righteousness. And just in Christ's death and His burial and His resurrection. We are immediately acceptable before the Father at all times. Because Christ is immediately acceptable at all times. And though we struggle with the flesh, though we tend to wander, though our faith is at times attacked and seems to, to dim in our, our, our heart's grasp on Christ and, and who He is for us, seems to, 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 to be covered with darkness, He never changes. We change, He does not. And the Father always sees His beloved Son when He looks at us. And that righteousness, listen, this is, this is absolutely vital to get this. That righteousness in which we stand is never our own. We have to grasp that. And that's good news. That's very good news. That's good news because we have nothing in and of ourselves that a holy God could approve of. We can't meet that bar. All of our righteousness is always and only Christ's righteousness counted to us. Imputed to us is the fancy word. But that, that exchange is real. Even though it isn't our righteousness, it doesn't infuse us with Jesus' righteousness, that doesn't make it any less real. The, the eternal God Himself looks at us and counts us as righteous for Christ's sake. And that's real. That exchange is real. He doesn't infuse us with some of the, His righteousness that then we, we live out and maybe we get God's approval if we do well enough. That's Roman Catholicism, and that is not good news. Because we drop that ball the second it's put in our hands. We can't please God in and of ourselves. His righteousness isn't infused in us that we then improve upon it somehow, or, or rather, don't, don't mess it up. That's not good news. It's Jesus' own righteousness the righteousness that's always perfect and can never decrease in its perfection. His own righteousness and His righteousness alone is our righteousness. That's good news. That's the best news. And so, Jesus doesn't have to persuade the Father to answer us. He mediates for us day and night through His own righteousness in His own satisfaction for our sins, counted to us by grace through faith. And when we pray on the basis of that reality, in other words, when we pray in Jesus' name, we're fully loved, fully heard, fully answered by the Father Himself, by our Father through Christ our Savior. I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father Himself loves you. Listen, that means we are always free to come before our Father as His own beloved children. Always. It doesn't depend on on how well you've done that day, how obedient you've been. He's not more welcoming of you when you've had a, a, a really good day, a, a, an obedient day. He's not scowling from His throne when you've blown it. He isn't a father like us, imperfect earthly fathers, 
I'm sometimes distant from my children. I sometimes am annoyed at them and patient with them and send them away because I'm a sinner. I'm an imperfect father. That is not our Heavenly Father. Listen to James 1.5. James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. In chapter 3 of James, he defines what he means by wisdom. By wisdom, James is it doesn't just mean like making good decisions. That's not merely what he means by that. James defi- excuse me. James defines wisdom in chapter three in terms of godly behavior, godly a godly heart. Things like gentleness, purity, mercy. Attitudes that are frankly opposite of the attitudes of our flesh. James calls that wisdom. In his book. And in that same passage, he also shows when we lack this wisdom, we're we're bitter and jealous and ambitious and acting out every evil thing that's in our hearts. That's what it means to not have wisdom. And so think again about what I just read in chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, lacks that. In other words, when you're blowing it, When you've got sinful, fleshly attitudes going on, and you're not living out godly attitudes, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. When we come every bit as nasty as we are on our worst day, when we come to our Father confessing our sin and and seeking his mercy and his grace, seeking the wisdom to love one another as we ought to, He gives it without reproach. You understand what that means? You know what reproach means? Reproach, that's that look you might give to your 16-year-old son or daughter when they ask to borrow the car keys. When you reluctantly hold out those keys with that look that says, if you mess this up, you're going to get it. You better not you better not abuse this that I'm giving you. That's reproach. That's a reluctance to to give and a kind of a, a veiled warning like don't drop this ball, don't screw this up. That's reproach. And yet, yeah, that's precisely what God does not do when we come to him for new mercy when we've sinned for the hundredth time that day, that's the attitude he does not have. He joyfully gives and gives and gives and gives grace again and again and again. We can always draw near to our Father through Christ. And we are always accepted. Because God doesn't change. The blood of Christ always presents us clean. And His righteousness is always counted as ours. Look at the last part of verse 27. Because you've loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Jesus says, the Father loves you because you've loved me and believed that I came forth from the As we talked about in another chapter where a similar statement was made, this is not saying our love of Jesus is the cause of the Father's love for us. That would contradict Scripture all over the place. Scripture everywhere declares that He loved us before we ever loved Him, right? our, Our love is the fruit of being loved. And so Jesus points to our faith here, our belief at the end of the verse. You've believed that I came forth from the Father. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. He came to us while we were still enemies, 
while we were still in our sin. And even for, for you and me, when you got saved, when you received Christ and his salvation for you, were you not still in your sins and your unbelief when he sent a preacher with that gospel? Is he not the one that moved your heart to, to say amen to the truth that you heard? Certainly. So he loved us before we ever turned to him. But so when we hold out our empty hands, when we hear of this gift he offers in Christ, and we hold out those sin-stained hands and receive that gift, that gift of the love of God in Christ, and we hold it in our hands, yeah, we love him out of the love he's shown. And so Jesus, simply, he, he's describing believers, those united to himself, in terms of the most basic fruit we bear. Having been loved, it produces love. So he says the Father loves those who love Jesus. Jesus dr drives all of this part, this section here, home with, with one of the most glorious affirmations possible. Look at verse 28 with me. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. On its face, that, you know, we've heard those kinds of words many times in this uh, discourse. But I have come from the, into the world, come from the Father and come into the world. This is none other than Jesus claiming divinity. That God the Son dwelt in the glory of the Father before time began, for all of eternity past. And then in due time, the, 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 the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, entered his own creation. Flesh was taken into divinity in the person of Jesus Christ forever. So all, well, why does that matter? All of this good news that Jesus has been preaching through these several chapters, three chapters, this gospel he's proclaiming to them, it's God's gospel. The Almighty himself came and accomplished this grace. Listen to 1 Corinthians 30 and 31. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that, as just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's God's gospel. God came into creation, accomplished all of this, and revealed it to us in this very passage. And the second part of verse 28 is, is what confirms this divine gospel as true and trustworthy. I'm leaving the world again and going to the Father. All of who Jesus is, all of what he did and what he said is confirmed as he's exalted back to the glory above and enthroned at the right hand of his Father. Good news. So Jesus has, has pointed to this reality that he came from God and was going back to God about seven times through this, uh, this, discard, this discourse so far. And each time he proclaimed it, what happened? He's met with confusion. Now, what is he talking about? But this is one of the clearest statements yet in the way he, he worded this. He very boldly stated. So how, how are the disciples going to receive it this time? Let's read on, starting in verse 29. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that... You know all things, 
and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. So hearing Jesus boldly state that he was God in the flesh, he had left the glory above when he was born in flesh here. The disciples, they think they're starting to get it. And they, they receive this with joy. Uh, verse 29, the disciples said, Lo, now you're speaking plainly and not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. If you can hear their, their affirmation of his divinity there. They're agreeing with Jesus in their response. You know all things. I mean, that's omniscience, right? That's something God possesses, no man, knowing all things. And they said, you have no need for anyone to question you. They're confirming that Jesus himself possesses all wisdom. He doesn't need to be questioned and, and second-guessed by men. So they're affirming his divinity. They go on to say, we believe that you came from God. But as Jesus is going to show them, they don't yet even know what it is they don't know. That was a, one of the, a really, really profound experience I had going to college, going to uh, you know Bible college. Like until you're immersed in it, you don't even know what you don't know, right? It's like the more you learn, the more you understand. I don't know. <laughs> So Jesus responds, verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. What understanding and what, what faith they had would soon be bitterly tested. And they wouldn't do well. All of them would scatter and would abandon Jesus. And I'm sure... You know, the disciples looking back after the Spirit comes, I'm sure they, they cringed a little bit at their overconfidence here. Once the Spirit came and actually illuminated their understanding and, and they understood all plainly. They understood just enough here to give them joy. Like, they're, they're legitimately feeling a confidence now, whereas before they were frustrated. But they were still very much in ignorance. So Jesus goes on to assure them that when they abandon him, which by the way, that abandonment is, is the proof of that. They weren't grounded. They, they all scattered. But Jesus assures them that when they do that, he'd never truly be alone. And yet I'm not alone, Jesus says, because the Father is with me. Jesus, he didn't need their support in order to be whole, Right? Being God, he's fully sufficient in and of himself at all times. Though all the world abandoned him, Jesus is whole and complete and righteous and satisfied in his Father. But what a wonderful Savior we have. That he came to save men like them and like you and I. Those who are weak under pressure. Jesus goes on to make one of his most triumphant declarations. That though the, the disciples' lack of devotion and understanding was about to be exposed through this fiery trial they were going to face, he was accomplishing everything for them. It's those very men that he's going through you know what carrying out this plan and will complete this plan he had served them in love all the way to his cross and his tomb let's read the last verse here 
This is Jesus' answer to their, his announcement of their dropping it, of their blowing it, of their scattering and abandoning him. Verse 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Wow. First part of verse 33 there. These things I have spoken to you. What things? Well, he's referring to all the wonderful things he's told them in this conversation. This upper room discourse. That that we, we summarized at the beginning a few minutes ago. All of that wonderful good news of salvation he came to bring. He's spoken those to them so that they may have peace in him. You know, I've often heard preachers, I'm sure you have too, who will talk about two different kinds of peace. They'll talk about a, a, a sort of a, a covenantal peace, a peace that we have with God, where we are reconciled to him, no longer his enemy. We are at peace with God. And then they'll, they'll say there's another kind of peace that is a sort of peace of mind that believers can have from God, a tranquility that God can, can give to believers. I'm not sure that those are ever really disconnected. As in terms of, of the peace that mind, the tranquility that we have is always going to be based on the peace we have with God. It's always what Christ accomplished that's going to give us peace of mind. They're certainly connected here in this passage. The good news of our unshakable peace with God, which is the sum of all that Jesus has been teaching them, all he's been saying to them, the things that he said, I've spoken these things so that you may have peace. That good news is the sum of, of, of what it is. Uh, or the good news is the good news of our peace with God. And that's the news that produces our peace of mind that he's talking about here. The peace that allows us to face even the tribulations of this world with, with peace of mind because we have peace with God. And in just a, a few short, simple, but forceful words, Jesus brings all the mercy of God to bear on them in the troubles they were going to face. He's placing them on an unshakable foundation of peace. Look at the second part of verse 33. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Trials and tribulations are a fact of life in this fallen age. In fact, in the next chapter, Jesus prays that we would not be taken out of the world, but rather that God would keep us through all the evils of this world that we have to endure. And so on the basis of everything he's taught them to this point, knowing the test that they would face as soon as they cross this river, Jesus commands them to take courage. What a command to receive from the Lord of the universe. Jesus commanded us to be comforted in him and all that he's accomplished. He commands us to be at peace through faith in him. To rest in the fact that he's accomplished everything for us and that we are safe in him. What a precious and gracious Savior we have, that that's his command. Take courage in who I am and what I've done and what I will do. And how is it we can have this peace? How is it we can be at peace? Listen to what he says. Take courage. I have overcome the world. 
this world that he keeps defining in terms of this, the, the hateful, uh, uh, fallen world that rejects God and his goodness. He says he's overcome it. Everything that stands between us and the glory of God above has been defeated. When Jesus overcame them all, he overcame them in our place. He overcame the world. Every enemy of our souls in this fallen world, yeah, even, even the corruption that remains in your own flesh, he's overcome it. Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, the scripture tells us. He overcame that which every one of us falls prey to. He overcame the world. Jesus faced down that, that great serpent, Satan, that great enemy of our souls, and he shattered his grip on us. Paul called Jesus the second Adam. Have you ever thought about what that means? When Jesus came, he came, as it were, into God's garden in his life. And he drove that serpent out of the garden. Instead of worshiping him and, and obeying him like the first Adam, the second Adam destroyed him. The second Adam succeeded where the first one failed. And he won for us. Everything and more of what Adam lost when he disobeyed in that garden. And yes, like, like God prophesied all the way back in Adam's fall, that serpent bruised Jesus' heel on that cross. But Jesus crushed his head through the very same cross. Just like David going against Goliath. Remember, David comes as a, as a child and incapacitates this giant, knocks him out with the stone from his sling. And in the same way, Jesus came in humility and he used his fallen enemy's own sword to cut off his head. Just like David with Goliath, Jesus destroyed death through death. He took the enemy's own sword and defeated him. And when he rose from the dead, Adam's curse was reversed in him. God said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And in Christ, the second Adam, we see life. Curse is broken in Christ. And on behalf of all of us, united to Christ, the curse is done. It's defeated. Jesus has overcome it. He's overcome the world. Jesus Christ himself is the untouchable foundation of peace that he's commanding them here to take courage in. Everything that God requires for us to be at peace with him has been accomplished in Christ. Everything. And the capstone of all of that was his exaltation to heaven above, his being caught up in glory, taken to the throne. This fallen world can no more rob our peace than it can storm the gates of heaven and drag Christ down from his throne. Our peace is untouchable because he's outside of us, exalted to the heavens, invincible, ruling and reigning, cleansing us, mediating between us and the Father, saving us, keeping us, and waiting for the time when he will return and establish the new heavens and earth. Martin Luther famously said, when I look within myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look outward to Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. And so Jesus says, take courage. All has been accomplished for you. Who can harm you? You are free to despise, to look down on every evil that would come against your soul. 
even the evil that remains in your own flesh, he's overcoming. We must not make a, a habit of avoiding the crosses that he brings us to bear in our life for his name's sake. We, we're, we're not to avoid them, but we can face them boldly because he's overcome the world. What enemy remains that Christ hasn't defeated? Our king has routed every single one. And he leads us in victory through all the suffering of this age, straight into the age to come, where all the suffering that we endured will be a distant memory. And he will then crown his own works of grace in us as though we deserved a reward for them. So take courage, saints. Our great God and Savior has overcome the world.